Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I never should have listened to that stupid story. It was just three days ago when my friend Akira told me about Teka Teka. He said it was an urban legend, a ghost story to scare kids. But now, as I hear that eerie scraping sound getting closer, I'm not so sure anymore. It started Friday night. I was walking home from work, cutting through the train station like I always do. That's when I first heard it. Like something dragging itself across the platform. I spun around, but there was nothing there, just an empty station bathed in flickering fluorescent light. I tried to shake it off, telling myself I was just jumpy from Akira's stupid story. But as I hurried home, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched, being followed. The next day was worse. I kept hearing that sound everywhere I went, in the hallways of my office building outside my bedroom window that night. Each time it was a little louder, a little closer, but whenever I looked, there was nothing there. Now, it's Sunday night, and I still can't escape it. I even heard the sound in my church sanctuary this morning, where I've always felt safe before, but not today. I can't deny it anymore. Something is after me. I'm huddled in my apartment, doors locked, lights on, but it doesn't matter. I can hear it coming down the hallway towards my door, that horrible, scraping, ticky-ticky sound. I remember Akira's words now. They say Tikka Tikka moves at an incredible speed. You can't outrun her, and if she catches you, she'll tear you in half, just like what happened to her. The sound is right outside my apartment door now. My heart is pounding so hard I can barely breathe. I can see a shadow under the door, but it's all wrong. It's just an upper body, dragging itself along with long, twisted arms. I squeeze my eyes shut, praying this is just a nightmare. But I know it's real. I can hear the claws scraping against my door, leaving deep gouges in the wood. Any second now, this shall break through. I should have been kinder. I should have helped others more. Maybe then Ticky Ticky wouldn't have come for me. But it's too late now. As my door begins to splinter, I realize with horror that my fate is sealed. The last thing I see is a mass of tangled black hair and a pair of hate-filled eyes. Then there's a flash of razor-sharp claws. And everything goes dark. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Strange occurrences took place in 1955 on a property near Mayanup, West Australia. Bill and Ethel Hack witnessed a series of inexplicable phenomena which Ethel meticulously recorded. From eerie whistling sounds and stones falling from the sky to strange lights and violent disturbances, Ethel's detailed written account reveals the chaos and fear that gripped their property, affecting both the Hacks and their Aboriginal workers. In June 1977, Portuguese Air Force pilot José Francisco Rodríguez encountered a mysterious UFO over the Castelo de Bode Dam, leading to a near-fatal dive and unexplained aircraft malfunctions. Despite numerous witnesses and a thorough investigation, the incident remains an unsolved incident. Just three days after Christmas in 1978, Bob Young and his girlfriend Elizabeth Andes were preparing to move out of their shared apartment in Oxford, Ohio. 
When Bob returned to help with the final cleanup, he found their apartment dark and silent. Inside, he discovered Elizabeth's lifeless body, brutally murdered in their bedroom, sparking a horrific mystery that would haunt the small college town for decades and put Bob Young in the crosshairs of local law enforcement. Everyone has heard of teleportation, alien abductions, and poltergeists. But without the pioneering work of Charles Fort, it's unlikely any of these phenomena would have entered public consciousness. But first, in Japanese folklore, there lurks a vengeful spirit known as Tekiteki, her upper body dragging along at impossible speeds with a chilling Tekiteki sound. If you hear her approach, run fast and be kind to others, for her wrath falls upon the cruel, and those who are unlucky enough to cross her path may find themselves torn in two, joining her in death. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Have you ever heard a strange scraping sound in the dark? If you're in Japan, it might be more than just your imagination. It could be the sound of Tekiteki, a scary ghost from Japanese urban legends. This creepy story has been scaring people in Japan for many years. Tekiteki is the ghost of a woman or a girl who was cut in half by a train. Now she haunts train stations and other places in Japan. The ghost only has an upper body and uses her hands or claws to move around quickly. She's known for chasing people and trying to cut them in half, just like what happened to her. The name Tekiteki comes from the sound she makes as she moves. People say it sounds like Tekiteki-Teki when her claws scrape against the ground. This eerie noise is often the first warning that Tekiteki is nearby. There are different stories about how Tekiteki came to be. Here are two of the most popular versions. Version 1, The Office Worker. This story takes place just after World War II in a city called Mororan on the island of Hokkaido. An office worker was attacked by American soldiers. She was so upset that she jumped from a bridge onto some train tracks. A train came by and cut her body in half. Instead of dying right away, the woman dragged herself to a nearby train station using just her arms, but when she got there, nobody helped her. People just covered her with a plastic sheet and left her alone. She died slowly in the cold weather. Now her ghost is said to chase after people who hear her story. She moves incredibly fast, up to 93 miles per hour. Some say she's looking for her lost legs. Others think she's angry at people for not helping her when she was dying. Version 2 – The Bullied Schoolgirl In this version, Tekiteki was once a young girl who was bullied at school. Her classmates made fun of her for being afraid of her own shadow. One day they played a mean trick on her using a cicada bug. The prank went wrong and the girl fell onto some train tracks. A fast train called the Shikansen came by and cut her in half. After she died, her angry ghost started haunting train stations all over Japan. She wants revenge on people who bully others, just like she was bullied in life. Tekiteki is usually described as a scary-looking ghost. She only has the upper half of her body, from the waist up. Her hair is long and messy, often covering her face. People say her eyes look mean and full of hate, which scares anyone who sees her. Tekiteki's arms are long and skinny. At the end of her arms are sharp claws that she uses to drag herself along the ground and attack people. These claws are said to have replaced her fingernails, which wore down from dragging herself around after she died. Depending on which story you believe, Tekiteki might be a grown woman or a young girl. Both versions are pretty creepy. If you're unlucky enough to meet Tekiteki, you'd better run fast. She's known for chasing people at very high speeds. 
Even if you're in a car, you might not be able to escape because she can move so quickly. If Tekateki catches someone, the stories say she will cut them in half, just like what happened to her. Some versions of the legend say that she might try to take the person's lower body for herself. What's even scarier is that people who are attacked by Tekateki might become Tekateki ghosts themselves. This means that there could be many Tekateki ghosts out there, all looking for new victims. If you're worried about Tekateki, there are a few things you can do to stay safe. First, be kind to others. Some people believe that Tekateki targets bullies or those who are mean to others. Being nice to everyone might help keep you safe. Next, carry an Amamori charm. In Japan, people often carry small charms called Amamori for protection and good luck. Some believe these charms can keep evil spirits like Tekiteki away. And of course, run away if you hear the Tekiteki sound. If you hear a strange, scraping sound that sounds like Tekiteki, it might be best to run in the other direction. And be careful specifically at train stations, since many versions of the story say Tekiteki haunts train stations be extra cautious in these areas, especially at night. The Tekiteki story has been scaring people in Japan for a long time, but why does this legend remain so popular? One reason is that it is based on real fears. Many people are afraid of accidents, especially those involving trains. The Tekiteki story plays on those common fears. The legend also teaches a lesson. Some versions of the story warn against bullying or being unkind to others. This moral message makes the legend more meaningful. Stories like these are easily spread as well. Urban legends of all types, including Tekiteki, are easy to share with friends, which helps them stay popular over time. The legend is also popular in that it is connected to other legends, something most urban legends don't do. Tekiteki can be linked to other Japanese ghost stories like the legend of Kashima Reiko. This connection helps keep both stories alive. The Tekiteki legend has had an impact on Japanese culture in a variety of ways. Some people say the Tekiteki story was created to stop bullying in Japan. Whether or not this is true, the legend does make people think twice about being mean to others. Tekiteki has appeared in Japanese horror movies books and manga, that is, Japanese comic books. This helps keep the legend alive and introduces it to new generations. Some people visit train stations or other places in Japan hoping to experience something spooky related to the Tekiteki legend. The belief that Amamari charms can protect against spirits like Tekiteki helps keep this traditional Japanese custom alive. Tekiteki isn't the only scary ghost story from Japan there are many other urban legends that are popular in Japanese culture. One example is Kashima Reiko, another ghost who lost her legs in an accident. Kashima Reiko, mentioned earlier, is said to haunt public bathrooms. She appears behind people and asks them where her legs are. To survive, you have to answer her questions correctly. If you get the answers wrong, she might rip your legs off. These kinds of stories are called Kaidan in Japanese, which means ghost story or weird tale. They've been a part of Japanese culture for a very long time. Of course, there's no proof that Tekiteki or any other ghosts are real. Urban legends like this are usually made-up stories that get passed around, but that doesn't stop them from being scary. So the next time you're near a train station at night, listen carefully. If you hear a strange scraping sound, it might just be Tekiteki coming to get you. But don't worry too much. Remember, she's after those who are not kind to others. Besides, it's just a story. Right? Coming up, in June 1977, Portuguese Air Force pilot José Francisco Rodriguez encountered a mysterious UFO over the Castelo de Boda Dam leading to a near-fatal dive and unexplained aircraft malfunctions. Despite numerous witnesses and a thorough investigation, the incident remains an unsolved incident. This story and more when Weird Darkness returns.
While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. It was a day that changed my life forever. With over 800 hours of flying time under my belt, I thought I'd seen it all. Boy, was I wrong. It was a gloomy day with dark clouds hanging low in the sky. I took off from the airbase at around 11.15 that morning. The flight was routine at first. About 45 minutes in, I was approaching the Costello de Boda Dam. That's when things got weird. As I scanned the area, I noticed a dark object emerging from the clouds ahead. My first thought was that it must be another plane, so I changed course and radioed back to base. Base, this is Rodriguez. Any other aircraft in my vicinity? Negative, Rodriguez. Our radar shows only you up there. That's strange, I thought. Curiosity got the better on me, and I decided to turn back for another look. What happened next, I'll never forget. Suddenly, right in front of my plane, I mean literally about 20 feet away, was this dark, round object. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. I tried to take in every detail. The upper part was black, though partially obscured by clouds. The lower section seemed to be made up of different panels. For a few seconds, we just hovered there, this strange craft and I, face to face. Then in an instant, it was gone. The speed was unbelievable. One moment it was stationary, the next it had shot off faster than anything I'd ever seen. But that wasn't the end of it. As soon as the object disappeared, my plane went haywire. It started shaking violently. The compass was spinning like crazy. Even though my engine was still running, the plane suddenly nosedived. I was plummeting towards the treetops near the dam, fighting with everything I had to regain control using every bit of skill I possessed. I managed to pull out of the dive at the last second. The treetops were so close I could almost touch them. Shaken to my core, but somehow unharmed, I flew back to base and landed. As soon as I touched down, I reported the incident. They had me go through a medical checkup, which I passed, but I could tell everyone was concerned. The look in their eyes told me they knew this was more than just some engine trouble. Even now, over 40 years later, I can recall every detail of that encounter. Experts are still trying to figure out what happened to me that day. I don't know what that object was or where it came from. All I know is that what I saw that cloudy June day was real, and it was unlike anything in this world. On a cloudy day in June 1977, something very unusual happened in the skies over Portugal. A young Air Force pilot had a close encounter with an unidentified flying object UFO, that left him shaken and experts puzzled. Even after more than 40 years, this incident remains one of the most interesting UFO cases in recent history. It was around 11.15 in the morning on June 17, 1977. Jose Francisco Rodriguez, a 23-year-old pilot with the Portuguese Air Force, was taking off from Tancos Air Base in his Dornier 27 plane. 
This was supposed to be a routine flight for the experienced pilot, who had already logged over 800 hours of flying time. The weather that day wasn't great. Dark clouds hung low in the sky, threatening rain at any moment. About 45 minutes into his flight, Rodriguez was approaching the Castello de Boda Dam, a big hydroelectric facility. Little did he know, he was about to have an experience that would change his life. As Rodriguez scanned the area around his plane, he suddenly noticed something strange. A dark object emerged from a bank of clouds slightly ahead of him. At first, he thought it might be another plane. To be safe, he changed his course and radioed back to the base to ask if there were any other aircraft in the area. To his surprise, the base said there was nothing unusual on their radar screens. The only plane they could see was Rodriguez's own Darnier. Curious about what he had seen, Rodriguez decided to turn his plane again to get a better look. What happened next caught the young pilot completely off guard. Suddenly, right in front of his plane, Rodriguez saw a dark, round object unlike any aircraft he had ever seen before. It was incredibly close, no more than 20 feet away from his own plane. Rodriguez tried to take in as many details as he could. He later described the object as having a black upper part, though some of it was hidden by clouds. The lower part seemed to be made up of several different panels. For a few seconds, the strange craft just hovered there, extremely close to Rodriguez's plane. Then, in the blink of an eye, it shot away at an unbelievable speed. What amazed Rodriguez was that it accelerated to this high speed instantly, starting from a complete stop. But the bizarre encounter wasn't over yet. Right after the object disappeared, Rodriguez's plane began to shake violently. The compass started spinning wildly, and despite the engine still working, the plane suddenly went into a steep dive. Rodriguez found himself plummeting towards the treetops near the dam, struggling to regain control. Using all of his pilot skills, Rodriguez managed to pull the plane out of its dive at the last second just as he was about to hit the trees. Shaken but unharmed, he was able to fly the plane back to the base and land safely. As soon as he landed, Rodriguez reported what had happened to his superiors. He also underwent a medical checkup, which he passed with no problems. However, the doctors and his commanders could see that Rodriguez was very upset by what he had experienced. They knew this was much more than just a case of engine trouble. The Portuguese Air Force took Rodriguez's report very seriously. They launched a thorough investigation into the incident and even worked with independent UFO researchers to try to understand what had happened. What made this case particularly interesting was that there were other witnesses who backed up parts of Rodriguez's story. Two shepherds in the area saw Rodriguez's plane suddenly dive towards the ground and then level out at the last moment. They even heard a loud noise that matched Rodriguez's description of opening the throttle to regain control. But there was more. At the same time Rodriguez was having his strange encounter, something odd was happening at the Castello de Boda Dam itself. Workers at the facility noticed a sudden drop in pressure and energy, as if everything was being drained for a few seconds. This matched the time when Rodriguez's plane was affected by the UFO. The incident at Castello de Boda Dam wasn't the only UFO sighting in Portugal around that time. In fact, there were quite a few reports of strange objects in the sky during the summer of 1977 and the years before and after. For example, in January 1977, just a few months before Rodriguez's encounter, a person in Carapito Biera Alta saw a dark, metallic, dome-shaped object hovering near the ground while walking their dog. They also reported seeing a tall figure standing near the craft before both disappeared in a flash of silver light. In August 1977, there were several UFO sightings across Portugal. On August 5th, a large red UFO about 100 feet wide was seen hovering near the ground in Reguendos de Fetal Liria. On August 12th, people in Lisbon saw a bright object flying in a perfectly straight line across the sky before vanishing. On August 14th, an object that gave off an orange light was spotted hovering over Cabadello. On August 24th, three soldiers at a military school in Lisbon watched a disc-shaped object move through the sky for about 15 minutes. More sightings continued throughout the fall. 
On October 18th, people in several parts of Portugal reported seeing strange lights and objects in the sky. Some described seeing a green UFO leaving a red trail behind it. The sightings didn't stop in 1977. Throughout 1978, there were many more reports of unusual objects in the skies over Portugal. In January, a disc-shaped object with red, green, and white lights was seen hovering over Figueira de Foz. In July, about 30 workers in Lisbon saw a shiny, ball-shaped object moving in a zigzag pattern across the sky. In August, campers near Porto witnessed a glowing object that seemed to grow larger as if it was falling towards them, then stopped and hovered before disappearing. In September, several residents of Cabo Ruivo saw an elongated object with a red light hovering only a few hundred meters from the ground, causing traffic jams as people stopped to look. The UFO sighting by Jose Francisco Rodriguez stands out among these many reports for several reasons. Not only did Rodriguez see the object up close, but other people saw his plane's strange behavior. Workers at the dam also experienced odd effects at the same time. The UFO seemed to have a real physical effect on Rodriguez's plane, causing it to shake and lose control. Because he was so close to the object, Rodriguez was able to provide a very detailed description of what he saw. The Portuguese Air Force took the incident seriously and conducted a thorough investigation. And despite the investigation, no one has been able to explain what Rodriguez encountered that day. Joaquim Fernandez, a Portuguese journalist and researcher who has studied this case, says it's very important because it shows a significant example of physical interaction between a strange craft and the instruments of an airplane. Over the years, people have tried to come up with explanations for what Rodriguez might have seen. Some suggest it could have been a natural phenomenon or a sky mirage. These are real things that can sometimes make objects in the sky look different than they really are, especially when you're flying at high speeds. However, many experts think this explanation doesn't fit what happened. The way Rodriguez's plane suddenly lost control matches what would happen if a large object passed very close by. This suggests that whatever Rodriguez saw was physically real, not just an optical illusion. Some researchers have pointed out interesting details about the incident. The cloudy, rainy weather might be important. Some people think certain weather conditions might be linked to UFO sightings. The incident happened over a large dam. Many UFO sightings seem to appear near bodies of water. The object didn't show up on radar, which is strange if it was a physical craft. This has happened in other UFO cases, too. The way the object could hover still and then accelerate instantly is not something our current aircraft can do. Timothy Good, a well-known UFO researcher, included this case in his book Beyond Top Secret. He points out that the Portuguese government has been unusually open about UFO incidents. In the 1990s, Good received information from the Portuguese embassy in London about their official stance on UFOs. They said that Portugal takes a cautious alert approach to UFO sightings. All pilots in the Portuguese Air Force are told to register the details of any non-identified objects they see while flying. This openness is different from how many other countries deal with UFO reports. It has allowed researchers to get more information about cases like the Castelo de Boda incident. Even though we know a lot about what happened that day, in June 1977, there are still many unanswered questions. What exactly was the object Rodriguez saw? Where did it come from? Why was it near the Castelo de Boda Dam? How could it move the way it did? Why didn't it show up on radar? Was it connected to the energy fluctuation at the dam? Does it have any connection to other UFO sightings in Portugal? These questions continue to puzzle UFO researchers and make the Castelo de Boda incident a fascinating case to study. While the Castelo de Boda incident is interesting on its own, it's also part of a bigger picture. All around the world, there have been many reports of unidentified flying objects over the years. Some, like this one, involve trained observers like pilots or military personnel. Others have multiple witnesses or physical evidence. Each of these cases adds a piece to the puzzle of understanding what these objects might be. 
Are they advanced aircraft from other countries? Natural phenomena we don't yet understand? Or could they be visitors from somewhere beyond Earth? The openness of the Portuguese government about UFO sightings has allowed researchers to gather more information about cases like this. This kind of transparency can help scientists and researchers better study these phenomena. In recent years, there's been a growing interest in studying UFOs seriously. In 2017, it was revealed that the U.S. government had a secret program to investigate UFO sightings. Since then, the U.S. military has officially released videos of strange objects encountered by Navy pilots. These developments show that even after many years, incidents like the one at Castello de Boda are still relevant. They continue to raise important questions about what might be flying in our skies. The UFO sighting over Castello de Boda Dam in 1977 combines a close-up sighting by a trained pilot, physical effects on an aircraft, other witnesses, and unexplained events at a nearby facility. Despite a thorough investigation at the time and continued interest from researchers, we still don't know exactly what Jose Francisco Rodriguez saw that day. It remains a fascinating mystery that continues to capture the imagination of those interested in unexplained aerial phenomena. When Weird Darkness returns, everybody has heard of teleportation, alien abductions, poltergeists, but without the pioneering work of Charles Fort, it's unlikely any of these phenomena would have entered public consciousness. But first, just three days after Christmas in 1978, Bob Young and his girlfriend Elizabeth Andes were preparing to move out of their shared apartment in Oxford, Ohio. When Bob returned to help with the final cleanup, he found their apartment dark and silent. Inside, he discovered Elizabeth's lifeless body, brutally murdered in their bedroom, sparking a horrific mystery that would haunt the small college town for decades, and put Bob Young in the crosshairs of local law enforcement. That story is up next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In December of 1978, just three days after Christmas, Bob Young and his girlfriend Elizabeth Andes were moving out of their apartment they had surreptitiously shared with another young couple, Sue Parmalee and her boyfriend John. As far as the girls' fathers were concerned, the two young ladies were sharing the apartment to keep costs down. Their straight-laced fathers didn't know that they were also sharing it with their beaus. That evening, December 28, Bob Young returned to the apartment with a bag of clothes and a vacuum cleaner to help his girlfriend clean up so as to ensure that they got back their deposit when they moved out. When he pulled up in the parking lot, however, the windows of their apartment were dark. Expecting to find a note explaining Beth's absence, he instead found something much more horrific. A bedroom spattered with blood, a toppled dresser, and his girlfriend's dead body where she had been strangled and stabbed. The apartment had no phone, 
so he had to run out into the cold December night to find someone who could call the police. Oxford, Ohio, where the two had attended Miami University, was a small college town that had not seen a murder in decades and certainly not one as grisly as this. When police arrived, they found Elizabeth Andes on the floor of her bedroom. Her feet and hands had been tied, and a piece of cloth had been shoved into her mouth, possibly to stifle her screams. The fashion student, Andes had been stabbed with a pair of her own sewing shears, which police found wrapped in a sweater on the floor. Andes was nude, save for one knee-high blue sock, and Young had covered her body with a sheet by the time the police arrived. A robe sash had been tied around her neck, one of her earrings had been torn from her ear, and there was blood everywhere from the stab wounds in her torso. Within 15 hours of the discovery of the body, police were sure they had their man. Young was a soft-spoken football player who had been dating Andes for three years. According to most of her friends, the two had been an enviable couple. Yet it didn't take long for authorities to zero in on him as their only suspect, and before long, Young had been spirited to another town for a polygraph test, which he was told he failed, and pressured into signing a confession which he would immediately recant. It wasn't just Young changing his tune that suggested that the story may not be as cut and dry as the authorities were making it out to be. Young's attorney noticed that the details of the confession didn't match the actual facts of the crime scene. This just doesn't add up, he later told the Cincinnati Enquirer. There were four or five of them, those inconsistencies. He started thinking, well, what, he lied about things that were physical evidence? Or was he told that and then he put it in his statement? Despite the holes in the case, police were certain they had their killer, and Young was arrested and taken to trial, where he was acquitted. With authorities assuring them that Young was the culprit and the case treated as closed, Beth's family sought justice the only way they knew how, by filing a wrongful death suit in civil court against Young. In a civil trial, the threshold of certainty for a jury is much lower than in a criminal case, and yet once again the jury sided with Young. Decades later, reporters Amber Hunt and Amanda Rossman made the case the focus of the first season of their hit podcast, Accused, and what they kept coming back to was how the police's fixation on Young prevented the case from being properly investigated. Without a conviction, they had nothing else to go on. Not only had they focused all of their energies on Young, neglecting other potential leads, but they had also logged the case as closed, meaning that it wasn't entered into unsolved murder databases, and the details of the crime were never compared to other slayings with similar MOs. Perhaps even worse, evidence was misplaced after Young's trial, making the odds of finding the real killer almost impossible, assuming that the jury was right and Young didn't do it. According to their reporting, the single-minded focus of the police wasn't due to a lack of other potential suspects. Beth's boss, Robert Buzz Call, called the police shortly after the murder and said, you might want to talk to me. He claimed that Andes had invited him over to her apartment the night before she died, a thing that had never happened previously. He claimed that the two smoked weed, drank wine, and watched a movie on TV. Beth's friends had their doubts. According to them, Call had a terrific crush on his employee, one that Andes neither reciprocated nor appreciated. One of her co-workers identified Call as a creepy guy and said that she and Beth always walked home together on the nights that he was there. Nor was Call the only one. There had been a conflict with the maintenance man at the apartment, who Andes claimed had left her door unlocked an incident which angered her so much that she reported it to the apartment complex on the day of her murder. There was an old flame from high school who also had a crush on the slain girl. And then there was Boyd Glasscock. Days after Young's arrest, while he was out on bail, Glasscock stopped by Young's house, something he had never done before. The two men had worked as house painters during the summer, but according to Young, hardly knew each other. That day, however, Glasscock admitted that he had loved Young for years and claimed that he knew that Young loved him too, that Beth had been in the way, and when Young asked him to leave, he shoved a wrapped gift into his hands, a pincushion, drizzled in some red substance that could have been blood. Unfortunately, none of these leads or any others were pursued at the time, 
due to the focus the police had placed on Young. Though he still maintains his innocence, even today, Young blames himself for the lack of closure in the death of the young woman he loved. If he had not been pressured into signing that confession, he reasons, the authorities would have been forced to pursue other leads and maybe catch the real killer. As it is, we may never know the answer to the question that Elizabeth Andy's father reportedly blurted out when Young's acquittal was announced in court. Then who killed my daughter? The name Charles Fort may be unfamiliar to many, but without him, there would in all likelihood have been no Leonard Nimoy hosting In Search Of, or The X-Files, or Barry Manilow songs about the Bermuda Triangle, or even Harry and the Hendersons. He is the spiritual pet owner of the Loch Ness Monster and the Yeti. The Roswell alien is his godchild. Born in Albany, New York in 1876, Fort was the inquisitive author who brought spontaneous combustion, water divining, and UFOs into the public domain. The writer's been called many things, from the patron saint of cranks to the father of the paranormal. The latter is quite a claim, especially since writers have been focusing on the weird and the monstrous since the days of ancient Greece. The key difference is that Homer, Edgar Allan Poe, Arthur Macon, Algernon Blackwood, and the rest wrote of the paranormal as fiction while Fort wrote of it as fact. The man who invented the word teleporter and was the first to suggest aliens might be living among us in human form was the son of a prosperous Albany grocer. Fort's mother died when he was a child. His father was a brutal autocrat, beating his three sons regularly and locking them in a darkened cellar for days at a stretch. Charles escaped the parental home for journalism and pulp fiction. He traveled to England, Scotland and South Africa, and married a nurse, Anna, who loved movies and parrots. They settled in a tenement in the Bronx. Charles struggled to make a living as a freelance reporter, topping up his income by writing jokes and washing dishes. Fort stumbled onto his calling one day in a New York public library when he was combing through old newspapers looking for ideas for feature stories. He started making notes of what we would now call anomalous events damned data, as Fort called it, because it had been condemned to scientific limbo by the academic establishment. Soon he was painstakingly cataloging the weird and the unexplained on thin strips of paper, which he filled in the shoeboxes that lined the walls of his New York apartment. By now, Fort's appearance, stocky, mustached, bespectacled, quizzical, and agitated, variously called to mind Theodore Roosevelt and Oliver Hardy. Perhaps that was accurate as he was both intrepid and comical. As a writer, Ford had a gift for capturing the language of tenement life. It was this that caught the attention of Theodore Dreiser. As a novelist, Dreiser brought gritty naturalism into modern fiction with works such as Sister Carrie and An American Tragedy. His personal beliefs, however, tended towards the mystical. According to his friend H. L. Mencken, Dreiser had a head filled with bohemian mush. So when Ford presented his new admirer with the manuscript of his novel X, a book in which Martians manipulate humanity using telepathic rays, Dreiser embraced it as a work of genius rather than tossing it out the window with a loud guffaw. Sadly, no publisher agreed with the great novelist's assessment. Ford's follow-up, imaginatively titled Why, and featuring a sinister alien race who live at the South Pole, was also met with outright rejection. Infuriated, the author burned both manuscripts, abandoned the life of a novelist, and focused instead on nonfiction. With the continued support of Dreiser, from 1919 the tales from Fort's stuffed shoeboxes gradually filled out to close to 60,000 items, with stories gleaned from long hours spent in the reading rooms at the British Museum in London were published to a predictable mixture of acclaim and derision. The Book of the Damned, 1919, New Lands, 1923, Low, 1931, and Wild Talents, 1932, are compendiums of anomalous happenings, parapsychology, and cryptozoology. 
I'll link to all three books in the episode description. The books combine accounts of wide-ranging unexplained events – fish falling from the sky in Canada, bloody rain in California, a downpour of frogs in Connecticut, the mysterious vanishing of a British diplomat, Benjamin Bathurst and the crew of the Mary Celeste, a werewolf in Northumberland, the footprints of a goat-like biped found in the snow in South Devonshire, with Fort theorizing on what it might all mean. Could the rain of fish and frogs come from a vast heavenly lake located between Brooklyn and the moon? Might the falling blood be the result of a ferocious battle between intergalactic whales? Was there some kind of vast underwater ocean into which all lost people and things were deposited? Whether the author took all this quite as seriously as some of those who later followed him was never entirely clear. The books are written with offhand wit and filled with jokey asides. Fort certainly never presented himself as the leader of a movement, nor would he have wanted to be one. I believe nothing of my own that I have ever written, he said. Like Groucho Marx, Fort would not have wanted to belong to any club that would have him as a member. Fort was a knee-jerk contrarian. He could not stand being told what to do and what to think. He was a man with a mischievous bent and a lifelong hatred of authority. Maybe we can blame his disciplinarian father for that. By the 1920s, scientific rationalism had assumed the role of a strict, po-faced patriarch loftily dismissing those who argued with its orthodoxy as lunatics or simpletons. Fort's response to what he regarded as a smug scientific establishment was essentially anarchic. He's the smart-ass kid at the back of the class bombarding the biology teacher with but what about? Whether Fort was a genuine believer in the paranormal incidents he chronicled or was simply using them to undermine the establishment remains an open question. He died in New York, aged just 57, probably from leukemia. His intentions, like many of the events he cataloged, remain enigmatic. While scientists and academics scoffed at Fort's work as nonsense, it rapidly became popular, particularly with writers of science fiction and weird tales. H.P. Lovecraft was an early admirer. Later fans included Philip K. Dick, Robert Heinlein, Stephen King, and Neil Gaiman. In the 1930s, writers began ransacking Fort's books for plot ideas for stories, novels, and movies. They still do. When fish fall out of the sky in Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia, Donald Sutherland screeches in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or a drummer spontaneously combusts in This is Spinal Tap, that is the legacy of Charles Fort. Up next on Weird Darkness, Strange occurrences took place in 1955 on a property near Mayanup, West Australia. Bill and Ethel Hack witnessed a series of inexplicable phenomena which Ethel meticulously recorded. From eerie whistling sounds and stones falling from the sky to strange lights and violent disturbances, Ethel's detailed written accounts reveal the chaos and fear that gripped their property, affecting both the Hacks and their Aboriginal workers. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. If you're planning a picnic, most everybody knows your biggest enemy is going to be ants – those dreaded, six-legged, creepy crawlers that seem capable of lifting an entire pickup truck over their heads and walking away with it – if the pickup truck was edible, that is. 
I don't think they have much need for a four-wheel drive vehicle. Now, replace your picnic pest with, instead of an insect, a Sasquatch. That is apparently what happened to one family. For realsies. You can hear the entire story in this week's Mind of Marlar at mindofmarlar.com. Few poltergeist events anywhere in the world are better documented than one that took place in 1955 on a large property near Mayanup, West Australia. Bill and Ethel Hack, who owned the property, named Kenanup, where it all started, were interviewed many times during and after the episode, and Ethel kept a detailed record of events, writing everything down in 1961, just a few short years after the incidents took place. What follows are her own words from her own writings, which have been edited slightly for clarity and to replace some words or phrases that would otherwise be insensitive to modern listeners. The phenomenon started May 17, 1955, and this is her story as she wrote it in her own hand. At about 10 p.m. I heard Gilbert Smith, an Aboriginal worker on the property, trying to wake up my son and a neighbor's boy who were both sleeping on the veranda. I concluded that he was wanting someone to help settle an argument in the native camp, so I went out and ordered him away. We'd had so much of it during the ten years he'd been in our employ. As a worker, he had proved satisfactory and was far more reliable in caring for machinery than any of the other Aboriginal men who'd drifted in looking for jobs. He was granted his citizenship rights without question and was then permitted to buy liquor, which meant that other Aboriginal people used to congregate whenever possible at his quarters and indulge in drinking sprees. They invariably ended in brawls with someone coming to the boss for help. The next day, Gilbert told Mr. Hack that there must be a madman in the vicinity, and they were too scared to stay by themselves in their quarters. When I had sent him away the night before, he'd gone to another nearby camp and persuaded a second family to spend the night with him and his wife. Gilbert and Jean Smith had both heard a whistle, a low, mournful sound sustained in the one key. At the same time, the kangaroo dog chained up near the quarters barked and howled and plunged around in a frenzy until the chain broke and he disappeared with a yelp into the darkness. I'd heard the dog from our house and wondered if foxes were about. Then an old golf ball came through the open door of Gilbert's house and an iron ring and some stones landed on the roof. The, she uses an impolite word here for black person, concluded that one of their own people had flogged the dog and was then coming to attack them. So Gilbert then came to get help. Although we did not believe his story, we knew that these people were genuinely scared. So Mr. Hack and the other white men who were then on our property took turns in staying on guard each night with a gun near Gilbert's place. Then the neighbors came to help as our men all told the same story of stones coming from all directions, and we all concluded that a group of culprits was responsible. Many of us saw lights just after dark seeming more than 200 yards away and at times over a half-mile distant. These seemed like a dull torchlight and would show for a second, go out, and show a little further on. Immediately after a light was seen, stones would fall on the roof of Gilbert's dwelling, no matter how far distant the light. The eerie whistle was heard by a number of people because as the days went by and the trouble continued, more and more visitors came to help solve the problem and catch the culprits, only to find nothing at all happening if they were unlucky or being witness to the phenomena if they were fortunate enough to strike a session. By 1957, our poltergeist phenomena had become well known, and we'd had visits from various people interested in psychic research, newspaper reporters, people who'd experienced similarity linking up all these happenings. Reading and studying everything we could lay hands on and following the advice given by a group of psychic research investigators from Perth, we tried to find a pattern underlying these disturbances. The publicity was unpleasant to us all, especially the black folks who are shy with strangers, but this same publicity brought so much contact with people connected with similar phenomena that the Smiths and their relatives became willing to help in recording these events. They'd been most anxious to leave our property before, believing that they were living in Janik, a local Aboriginal word for spirit or ghost infested area. We found that there was activity only if Jean Smith or her daughters were in the dwelling. 
If she was made angry, generally because of Gilbert's drinking, the disturbances were stronger. When bad weather was approaching, either heavy rain, strong wind, or thunder and lightning, the phenomena seemed to occur. In both 1955 and 56, when this activity started up, Jean must have been in the early stages of pregnancy. When similar phenomena occurred in a nearby camp also proved to be genuine, the wife Molly, a niece of Jean's, was also a few weeks pregnant. In both camps, there were various children, including teenage girls. It often seemed that the whole area of country within a half-mile radius must be allied with some strong force like electricity or magnetism. As well as the small torch-like lights reported earlier, many of us saw lights easily as big and bright as a car light, but throwing no beam. One morning, when Mr. Hack and the men went to pick up stones and sticks off the crop, which was only just showing through the soil, they had found that all over an area of about one acre, in one high corner of the paddock, large clods of earth and pieces of wood had lifted and turned over. Rain had fallen during the night, but it ceased early, and in each case the hollows where the clods had been showed quite dry. Also the exposed underside of the clods, but the rest of the ground was wet. There were no footprints of any sort showing on the wet soil until the men went to work in the paddock. This section had been one place where lights had been seen. On one occasion, a group of visitors had motored to the road near the area as fast as they could, thinking to catch the culprit with the torch. Near Gilbert's place, I found many instances of stones having moved. I went to that paddock, and I saw that myself because it was so interesting Bill came back to the house to fetch me to have a look at it. Over this whole area, about as big as this whole building, everything was turned over, and where it was turned over it was quite dry, as if a strong force had sort of swept over and upended everything. Only in that one area. And that later on is it still on because I'm sidetracking, just to tell you that a chap from By Up Brook, one of those who can find things by having something in his hand, you know, well, all sorts of things he could do, and he was one of those. See, that's another magic trick that's not magic, it's natural. He told me that the whole area answered strongly to uranium, which he had been divining. At the time when this phenomena was taking place, in a second camp situated on another hill not far from Smith's place, one of the black boys employed at the time on harvest work came to Mr. Hack with a story that we could not have believed, had we not by then read books on psychic phenomena. This lad had never been to school, and it was impossible for him to have read about it happening elsewhere. During the night, he had felt a tremendous pull on his feet, and it had awoken him up. Then he realized that his small brother, sleeping on the ground beside him in a tent, was sliding head first past him. He grabbed the sleeping child and held him still. The pull ceased. The lad got up and went out the camp tent and stirred up the fire outside. As the fire crackled up, his sister came out of the girl's tent, telling her brother that her hair had been pulled so hard that it had woken her up. They were both very afraid and this family shifted camp as soon as possible. This happened so we'd read of other things, incidents of a feeling as if the hair was being pulled. That happened elsewhere. Early evening seemed to be the time when activity was strong. On one occasion, I just got out of the car and saw a stone about six feet away from me, a few inches off the ground. It came straight at my ankle, hit it, and dropped straight to the ground. Although we often saw things in flight and watched them land, we could never see anything leave the ground. A few seconds later, an onion coming from near Gilbert Smith's dwelling, which I was approaching, made a beeline for a point just above my knee. It hit and fell to the ground, staying exactly where it landed. Yet the ground was hard, and when I picked it up and dropped it, the onion rolled. That was another point of all these things. They'd drop and stop, as if something had just exploded there. A little later, I was standing just inside the three-sided shed, which stood close to the Smith's quarters and served in an extra shelter for the bigger members of the family or the relatives who frequently visited them. Gene Smith also cooked the food here in a camp oven on an open fire, set up for safety in an old petrol drum, opened out. She'd been telling me that odd things, sticks, stones, and a shoe had seemed to come along the alleyway between the dwelling and the shed, so I was looking out to watch for something in that line. I felt a soft, heavy blow in the middle of my back and looked around to see a potato fall on the ground. Two more hit me in exactly the same place, feeling more like a blow from a small bag of flour than a hard object. Immediately behind me was a store cupboard rigged up out of kerosene boxes, and I knew no one present had done it. 
although by this time I'd often seen objects moving, all rather slowly, and others had been hit by them. I'd never been struck in the back before. When I picked them up and dropped them again from the same height, judging to be my waistline, the potatoes always bounced and rolled away. But when they'd hit me and fell, they stayed still just as they landed. So Jean said, I've got no potatoes. I'll put them in. I'll cook them. So she took them to the field and put them in the dish. When they landed, it seemed to me that some magnetic force just held them where they landed. That's what it seemed to me to be. This seemed to be typical of all objects moving during periods of activity. I once saw a bottle. We went up to the camp as often as we could because they were afraid. I was sympathetic with people that are afraid. So this particular afternoon I'd gone up, I knew Jean and Gilbert were away and the children had come off the school bus. I went up to be with them near the camp until their parents came back. I once saw a bottle turning slowly over and over and glinting in the bright sunshine of a fine afternoon travel slowly from the direction of a rubbish dump at the back of Smith's place and land on the iron roof. There it stayed. But if any of us tried to mimic the throw, the bottle would have to move quickly and on striking the roof would bounce, roll, and smash. On only one occasion, we recorded one bottle smashed and a second rolling off the roof and breaking on the ground. This happened during a violent session lasting only ten minutes in which seven bottles several half-bricks and many stones fell on the roof. When this particular session started, there was only a girl of ten years minding the baby in the open shed. The rest of the family were at the farm shed, 300 to 400 yards away, where Mr. Hack and Gilbert were working on some machinery. They all went quickly to the camp, where the frightened child came running out and calling to them. On two occasions, I experienced a sudden puff of dust and ashes on my forehead and the front of my hair. The first time, I was in the open kitchen shed, casually conversing with Gene Smith, but the second time I was alone in their main dwelling, all the family being outside round the fire at the time. That group from Perth told me that to talk to Jean, that she was frightened of the men, that she would talk to me and for me to try to find out all about her, which I did. I used to go up and talk to her and ask her about her children and all that and trying to find out if she was a confused person or something but the one that finished up confused was myself, of course. Another evening, a neighbor called in on his way home from work to see if there was anything happening. We drove up the hill, and there in the headlights we could all see tiny stones falling like showers of hail. This was at a spot a little distance from the camp. These showers were spasmodic, but were then falling on an area about the size of an average room. One of the biggest surprises we had in the early stages of this disturbance when we were looking for some culprit to blame with no success was when Gilbert Smith came to Mr. Hack with an urgent request from all the black people for permission to bring a witch doctor to help them. We'd employed Gilbert for ten years, and on account of our sympathy towards these people had tried to study and understand them. We really thought we knew the aboriginals, but we realized then what we only knew, what they permitted us to know. Although they were far enough away from the old aboriginal to have lost the art of tracking and knew very few native words, they still had their witch doctors, three of whom were living in the great southern area. So old Sammy was brought up from Mount Barker together with a young man who cared for him. This Sammy was the man, half Chinese, half aboriginal by the looks of him, so had found a lost child in the Mount Barker district by seeing him from the distance a half a mile in thick scrub. Sammy told Mr. Hack that had the searches been between him and the lost boy, he could not have seen him, but the way was clear so Sammy had the chance to prove his natural gift. He stayed with Smith's for a few days during which all was quiet, and he told them that it must be caused by a spirit or Janik. After he returned to Mount Barker and the activity started up again, Sammy and the other witch doctors decided that the spirit must be that of Gene Smith's father, Mr. Alf Eads, who was then a very sick old man at Kojanup. The spirit needed to be put back in the old man's body, so they said, but was worrying Jean because she was the favorite child. Mr. Hack was present at the ceremony which took place in the native camp at Kojanup. Jean Smith watched carefully because she did not really believe all this. Her father roused himself to declare emphatically that his spirit was not doing this, but he was old and weak and slept most of the time. Mr. Hack saw the younger witch doctor go a little distance away carrying a blanket. Jean's keener eyes saw him in the evening gloom run a dodge here and there after something small and white. He returned to the camp with the blanket rolled up in front of him, puffing, sweating, and apparently holding the blanket with difficulty. In the tent, he and Sammy leaned over Mr. Eads and opened the blanket. 
They had both felt that the performing of the ceremony would give the black people a sense of security and put their minds at rest, which would probably result in a complete cessation of the phenomena. However, no sooner had the car door opened outside Smith's dwelling and Jean started to get out of the car when the stones began again to fall on the roof. A few weeks afterwards, Mr. Eads passed away. The disturbance continued. By May 1957, Smith had become very restless and wanted to leave. They got work elsewhere and said they were not being troubled anymore. They called in as they were driving past on June 8, and Mr. Hack persuaded them to visit their old dwelling. As they drove up and opened the car door, one stone landed on the roof, followed by a shower of small stones. Then came more showers of stones, one bottle of milk tin, a piece of bone, and one stick. I walked up and stood on one side of the house while all the others were around the other side. Looking up, I saw a stick turning over and over and going slowly, having apparently come from behind me. It dropped in front of the others. The Smiths called again on August 10 when we had some of our own relations visiting us from Perth. We all went up to the abandoned camp and in a few minutes one bottle, various stones, one at a time, an empty matchbox and a cigarette butt were collected as they fell to the ground, some inside the hut, some out. Then on June 26, 1958, when the Smiths were camped on the Mayan Up race course where they had been for five weeks, a lemonade bottle suddenly landed on their water tank, followed by sticks and stones. Gilbert eventually went to the nearest farmhouse and begged the owner to ring up for the police. They came out from Boyup Brook at 2.30 a.m. and stayed for some time. All was quiet then, but there was further activity later, so the Smiths moved away next day. In March 1957, a similar disturbance was reported from Pumphrey, a small town in the Great Southern District. This continued for about a week and seemed to fade out. Once again, the black family camped on the property was beset, and Mr. Hack paid a visit to the place to compare his experiences with theirs. This family, the Uggles, are related to Jean Smith through her mother, Mrs. Alf Eads. On September 26, 1957, poltergeist phenomena started up in a completely different area, having nothing to do with black people. This was at Mr. George Dixon's place near Boyup Brook. Here it seemed to be an evidence that Mr. Dixon's son, Harvey, was near. We visited the Dixons and had no doubt of the genuine nature of the disturbance. I saw small stones land on the roof of an underground tank, seemingly to come from a high point immediately opposite where a group of us stood together. Mr. Hack saw some of the odd things that happened in the dairy when a spade, a milking stool, a milk bucket, and a straw broom all seemed to move after the boy had passed them and was at least a yard away from them. This activity faded out after 13 days, which period of time seems to be the most usual in poltergeist phenomena. Many people have asked me if I was afraid. I doubt if the English language contains the words necessary to describe the feelings of confusion and terror which can grip the mind when confronted by this type of disturbance. Well, we thought at first that someone was deliberately frightening the Smiths, I was so angry that I was prepared to face any mad or drunken native because I'm anything but brave and know how awful it is to be scared. Although I can understand and respect other people's belief in spirits, I can never accept this as an explanation. The whole business is apparently so senseless, yet so similar, no matter where the report comes from, that it must be a pointer to something as yet undiscovered. Some tremendous force is indicated strong enough to cause, on one occasion, an explosive bang which shook the Smith dwelling, on another to shatter a cup standing on the kitchen table. The more one studies about psychic phenomena, the less terrifying it becomes, because it seems to be a natural force linking, somehow, with people and things around them. It becomes more of a puzzle than a challenge. In a bit, at the end of this story I'm writing, 1961, Jean Smith now has her twelfth child, born approximately a month ago. Towards the end of January or early in February, Mr. W. Hack had occasion to visit the Smith camp near Boyup to deliver some meat which he had promised Gilbert. It was dusk, and as he drove up in the ute and slowed to a stop, a stone landed on the roof of the ute. During the next half hour, at least three dozen stones landed on the ute or hit the camp and eerie whistling was heard. The whistles seemed to be coming from a height of about 12 feet in varying directions, and one seemed to come from inside the tent. The whistles were all on the same note and lasted about two seconds. The phenomena stopped in and Jean told Mr. Hack that it had occurred spasmodically for some time prior to that, but neither she or Gilbert had mentioned it to anyone, not wanting notoriety. All the stones were small on this occasion, the largest being the size of a walnut. 
most of them being no bigger than peas. And what I haven't got in this journal is that the stones were always warm when you picked them up, sometimes so hot you could hardly handle them. And the one time I didn't mention it either that I was standing outside the camp, not Smith's, the other one. This would have been another small aboriginal camp around 600 meters from the Smith's. It was after school, at least school time, had gone up to our entrance, and this is where there was a camp opposite, and I went to speak to Molly Krakauer. Molly was Gene Smith's niece. This is the camp near where they had that experience of the tents and the pulling of the hair. I was outside their camp and waiting the school bus, and I was looking up into a clear gray sky. It was winter time, and it was as clear as clear. And I was thinking, what does cause this? And as I looked into the sky, there was a tiny shape like a little pea. It suddenly took shape and it became a stone and dropped on the roof of their dwelling. The little boy from inside heard it fall and came running out and clambered up the roof and got it. It was a little stone, and he gave it to me, and it was very warm. I'd actually seen it taking place in the air, and the movement seemed to be, you know, when you look through a kaleidoscope and the things jerk into place. A few jerks, and it was a stone. First of all, I thought it was something coming. Well, first I thought it might be a bird flying, it all happened so quickly and your mind jumps about. I thought it was a bird in the distance coming this way, but no, it was a stone that formed. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14 and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And a final thought. God's man in the center of God's will is immortal until God is done with him. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>